Well, thank you for being with us this day as we continue on in our sermon series, and we're going to look at a new you in 22, and today we're going to be focusing on new habits for 22, and so how can we engage in those new habits in order to move us towards, well, what God wants us to be as His people in 2022, and to shape us into different ways and into different directions in our lives. I also just want to have a prayer of a blessing for you, just a, and protection for you and for you and your family as we go through this current COVID surge, uh, and uh, may God's blessings be upon you, but also on those people that you might know uh, that also are infected as well. Uh, we give you thanks and praise for your being here this day, and so we just ask that you would pray with us here together. We give you thanks that you are here with us, wherever we might be in this day, uh, that you do have your Spirit's presence with us as we come into your place of worship, wherever that might be in our homes or in our offices or here in this place of uh, the sanctuary. We'd ask that you'd guide us, direct us, strengthen us, and encourage us so we might be faithful, faithful to follow you, and to live that life that you want, that life of abundance. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing. Stood on the stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But right now, right now, I just can't. It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring.
Well, thank you for being a part of our uh, worship series uh, and for this new worship ser ser sermon series, should I say, of uh, a new you in 22 as we come into this new year in January. Of course, in January, it's an important time of the year for a lot of people to make resolutions for the new year. And I'm just wondering, did you make any resolutions for this new year of 22? Uh, maybe you did some. Uh, and of course, there's uh, you know a variety of kind of common resolutions that people make, new habits that they're going to get into in, this, in a new year. Uh, a lot of people are going to be exercising. Uh, I used to go over to Golds quite a bit, and uh, the guy, people over Golds would say, man, we, we get a kind of a, a surge of people coming in to, to exercise in January, uh, or maybe you're going to have a, some dieting going on, or some intermittent fasting going on, or something like that in 22, and you're going to get a new you, and what have you. And, and of course, the reason why a lot of people do that is they, they just want to get healthier, uh, and so they get into habits, you know, habits of gym time, or habits of maybe they work out at home. Of course, that's been pretty popular after the COVID hit a couple of years ago, uh, and maybe you're going, to go out, you're going to buy a Peloton bike, or you're going to buy a rower or something like that this year. Man, we're going to get into it. I'm going to get into the habit because I want those benefits. I want the results of it. You know, it's fascinating to me. I was looking at uh, TV the other day, and there was a medical doctor who was talking about the benefits of exercise, right? And he says, if you just go from poor cardio health to regular, just regular cardio health. If you just make that jump, there's a threefold reduction in all causes of mortality. I thought, wow, that's kind of incredible. So, you know, we have this reason and we get into this habit because we want these results uh, and because we're going to make that choice to change. Well, the truth is we make our choices and then our choices make us. And uh, so that's what happens when we decide to, to get into new habits. And, and what I want to do today is I want to talk about some new habits, not some health habits so much in the sense of physical health, but some different kind of habits to develop a, a new you and a new me in 22. And so let, let's take a look at some new habits for this year. Uh, but uh, what I want to do is just want to start by telling you a story about a guy by the name of Timothy. Maybe you, maybe you know a Tim, maybe you know a Timothy. Uh, and that comes from 16th chapter of Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament. And it says this, you'll see that quote, uh, to Lystra, that is Paul and Silas, they went to Lystra, uh, that is in what would be in today's uh, Turkey. And where there was a disciple of Jesus named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, uh, and of his father who was a, Jew, was a, a Greek. And so it says that Timothy, uh, from what you see in these passages, Timothy was really, he was, yes, he was, had a Jewish mother, but he was culturally, he was uh, Greek, or he was uh, uh, that section of the world. And uh, the Greeks, they believed in gymnasiums and exercise and what have you. And so Paul was using that image in order to lead Timothy down a different path. And so in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, he talks about how, you know, uh, physical exercise, yeah, that's good and it's beneficial some, there's no doubt about that. But then he says this, you'll see that quote from 1 Timothy 4, 7. Take the time and the trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. Spiritually fit, and you'll see that different translation. Spiritual exercise will help you not only in this life, but in the next life too. He says, okay, so I know you're going to the gym, and that's important in your culture, and you know, exercise and all this kind of stuff. But he says what's really important is to keep yourself spiritually fit. And the spiritual life has to be fed by spiritual habits that we get us into that put us into spiritual shape and that draw us near to God and give us a chance to live that uh, purpose that God has for our lives and to handle adversity in His presence and with Him walking with us. And so what I want to do today is, as we start this news year is simply to talk about four habits that will help you and me to get spiritually fit in 2022. And the first one I want to lift up is get time with God every day. Get time with God every day. You know, uh, when I was younger, they used to talk about a quiet time, that uh, somebody would have a quiet time. And in the quiet time that you would take each day, what you would do is you would, be, uh, you would read the Bible. And the purpose for reading the Bible was not some kind of analytical study of the Bible, but it was to read the Bible so that God could use it in order to lead you and in order to teach your spirit and, and to develop your sense of His grace and presence in your life. And so that was part of quiet time. The other part of quiet time was a time for prayer. And now sometimes it was a time of spoken word or sometimes it was thought prayers or sometimes it was you were praying the Psalms or sometimes it was just simply silence as you came before the Lord. But that quiet time that you would have each day. And the reason why that was important, a lot of times people would, would use that. The reason was to get direction from God, to get guidance from the Lord. And that's why the Psalm, the, the Psalm of Psalm 23, it's translated, part, uh, one part translation has it, uh, show me the path 
where I should go, O Lord. Point out the right road for me to walk. Lead me. In other words, the, the reason why we want that habit is because of we want God to direct us and guide us. And so the psalmist, he prays that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. I want you to lead me. I want you to guide me in my life in those paths that you know that are best for me. And the way to find out what that is is to spend time with God every day. You know, uh, the habit that you really need to develop in order to do that is you, you just simply have to be in the habit, get into the habit of getting along with the Lord. Uh, now, you'll see how Jesus did that. So that quote from Luke 5, he says this, Jesus often, often withdrew to lonely places. And the word for lonely places in the Greek is eremos. Uh, and it's a, a lonely place, a deserted place. Maybe it's even a desert. Uh, somewhere there's, there's nobody around and prayed. He, that's the way Jesus did his spiritual life. And that's really important. Uh, let me just give you a couple of examples of that. I want this example from my own personal experience of how, how God can really impact you in those quiet times when you get alone with him. Uh, yeah, but I don't know, it was probably six years ago now. Uh, I was uh, in a place by myself, kind of out in, in the middle of nowhere, and I was there, and I was, I was, you know, had spent enough time away that I, my mind had kind of gotten settled down, and, and I was focused in, and I was present with the Lord there, and I prayed this in that silent space. I said to him, Lord, lead me. Uh, you know, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do, Lord? And it was like, wow, just almost immediately, uh, there was this, this just words that, uh, that was entered into my heart and my mind. Watch what I'm doing and join in. Oh, oh, yeah. It's kind of like I never thought about it like that before. But he, he says, this is what I need for you to do. I need for you to watch what I'm doing. Watch where the Holy Spirit is acting ahead of you. And then join in with what God's Spirit is doing. Or uh, another guy uh, in the fourth century by the name of Arsenius uh, who he was, a, he was a very um, influential guy. He was the, he was the um, uh, tutor to the two sons of Emperor Honorius, uh, who was the emperor of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, so he was really privileged. He had uh, a lot of wealth and connections and what have you. And, and, you know, Arsenius prays to God and says this, Lord, lead me in the way of salvation. Lead me in the way of salvation. And God replies to him, flee. In other words, get by yourself, flee, be silent, pray. I need and you need to be in a habit of getting along with the Lord every day, every day, so that he can lead our lives. And the result of that is God's help in our lives. You see what uh, this quote from, uh, from John 15, what our Lord Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you may ask for anything you wish and you shall have. And he says, he's trying to say to us, if you will get connected with me and if you will, if you will turn your life towards me, uh, that you will have a, a power working in you and a guidance working in you that is greater than you ever had before and I will help you. And so this is the question is, so when are you going to get that time alone each day? Where are you going to get that time alone? Where are you going to build that habit in 22? Now, the next habit I want to lift up is give a tithe to God every week. Give a tithe to God every week. Now, I'm sure somebody said, uh-oh, Pastor, you've gone to meddling now. Uh, but, okay, you think this is meddling. Wait until a little later in this sermon. Uh, give a tithe to God every week. And a tithe is I'm giving the first 10% of my income back to the Lord as an offering. And the reason why it's important to do that is that it draws me closer to God. It draws me closer to God. Now, Jesus laid this out perfectly when he says in Matthew 6, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Isn't that true? Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. I mean, if you want the easiest way to find out about where your heart is, check your checkbook. I mean, where's your money going? I mean, if you, if you just kind of do a little audit and just figure out where your money is going, that shows you really what's important to your life. And what... The scripture is trying to guide us in is that, that we, need to, we need to also give a tithe to God on a regular basis, get a tithe every week. And that's why it's so important. That's why in Deuteronomy 14 it says this, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. To always put God first in your life. In other words, it's not about the money, it's about the priority. 
It's not about the money. It's about who's first in my life. You know, I, I, I came to that conclusion uh, through some painful circumstances uh, many years ago when I was just uh, fresh out of seminary. And I think it was my second year of ministry, full-time ministry in a church. And uh, I was giving some, but I had never been really taught about giving. Uh, and neither, honestly, oddly enough, in my church but, that I grew up in, this really. But also at seminary, they never taught about giving, which is like crazy. Uh, and uh, so I'm, you know, and got a salary, and my wife's got a salary coming in, and, and we're, well, we're going to try and we're going to save some. And so we get a, a savings account going, and we're putting money, and they're kind of socking some money away because we were just, you know, I just came out of seminary as a poor student. Uh, and so we were socking some money away. Man, we get, we get uh, about $10,000 put away. Well, that's, you know, back in the day, that was pretty good stuff. Uh, and so I, I, I turned, I found this tax accountant that does taxes for clergy, and uh, I put in all the information and stuff like that, and I call him up, and, and I can remember that call quite well because I call him up and I ask him, how much do I owe in taxes? And he says, well, now this is like April the 7th or something like that. He says, well, you owe $10,000 in taxes now. Oh, no. You know, boom, like that. All of my savings were gone. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm, okay, okay, we'll, we'll get that done. Uh, but after that phone conversation, I got off and I said, and I thought, man, I did something wrong with my, ta- with my money. And I thought, okay, so I've got I to gotta kind of write down how I'm going to start spending my money. What am I going to start allotting that to? And, the, and I got a piece of paper and a pencil, and I wrote out this. This is the first thing I wrote. And this sounds crazy, I know. Give more to the Lord. That was number one, the first thing. How do I get my finances right? Give more to the Lord. And what my wife and I did was over a period of time, now we didn't just jump in, boom, all of a sudden we're not giving much to give 10%. But over, well, you know, over a period of time, we slowly, each year, increased, 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 giving you get it up to the tithe and that was so important that was so important because it here's what it did it changed the way I looked at money it changed the priority that money had in my life and money started to be well first of all it's about worshiping God that's the first thing so I I just want to encourage you to get a weekly habit a weekly habit of doing this. You'll see the quote from 1 Corinthians. On the first day of every week, set aside some of what you have earned and give it as an offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. Now, why is that important? That's because a regularly scheduled worship offering. Every week I'm going to do it. Because, why? Because I, I know that I need to, to express to God how much he means to me. Now, I understand that there's some of you may think, well, wait a second, I got to... I check the first of the month I get so I can do it then. Uh, okay, I got you. But it's important we don't forget. We don't forget to put him first. And what are the results of that? Well, the results are blessings. Uh, and you'll see there, uh, bring uh, your whole tithe into my storehouse, says the Lord. Tre- uh, test me in this and see, says the Lord, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out as much blessings, so much blessings that you won't have enough room for it. You know, what I found out about it was that when I did this on a regular basis is that, you know, I, uh, I found out that it shifted the way that I handled money and it shifted the way that I saw money. And at the end of it was I really, I really don't have any financial worries. Now, you know, sometimes that means you got to live a little frugally, but I really don't have any financial worries. But the, something is better, and that is the privilege, the privilege of, of worshiping the Lord through my offerings, the privilege of saying thanks through our offerings. So give a tithe of my income every week. And then the third, the third habit, if you want to have a new life, how about this one? Get together with reg- believers regularly. Wow. Uh, fellowship, right? Uh, with others in small groups, fellowship with others in corporate worship as we worship together as the body of Christ, uh, you know, in person. You know, the reason why is it's to get encouraged. To get encouraged. Look at what uh, Hebrews 10 says there. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together, which is like, I read that and I always think, well, isn't that great? They had the same thing going on in the first century. 
uh, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage each other. He says there is an encouragement in meeting together. Now, I understand we've got COVID and, and we've got another COVID surge and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, you know as well as I do that COVID has led to isolation. And, and sometimes it's necessary. Uh, but there's another kind of problem that's happened, and as we've got so fixed on TV and, and streaming and, and Zoom and, and YouTube and stuff like that, uh, uh, we've got disconnected more. And the encouragement, there's an encouragement in being together in person. And again, I understand sometimes that's not possible, but, boy, it's an important habit to have. It's an important habit, a habit of Day after day, he says, they're day after day meeting together. Look at what uh, Acts 5 says. They met day after day in the temple courts, okay, the temple courts for, for worship together in the house of God and from house to house and other, for small group meetings and, and for prayer meetings and what have you. And you can do that. You can do that in family prayer time, can't you? Every day. Or in a weekly small group. Or, you know, coming to Sunday worship when that's a possibility for you, or in studies that you sign up for, or in a Wednesday night meal that you come to just to be around other Christians, see other Christians, you know, there's, there's an encouragement in that. Now, what's the results? The results is more effectiveness in our spiritual life. More effectiveness in our spiritual life. Look at that quote. Two are better off than one because together they are more effective. If one falls down, the other can help him up. Help him up. And that's exactly what happened with uh, the church there in the first part of Acts. They together, they were focused on the Lord together. And it says thousands of people uh, came to know Jesus. And not only that, but the poor were cared for as well. In other words, they acted as a dynamic church as they got together and they encouraged one another. Now, there's, a, there's another thing that uh, uh, it's a habit that I really think we need to practice. And that is... If we're, going to, if we're going to have a new you and a new me in 21, 22, and that is give forgiveness to everyone. Give forgiveness to everyone. And, and the reason why is because my forgiveness from God depends on it. You know, look, look at what our Lord Jesus Christ says about how we should pray the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Oh, you mean i got to forgive that person who hurt me? Well, that's kind of what he's saying, isn't it? And so I need to develop a habit. You need to develop a habit. The habit is continually forgive. Now, there's a great, great little two-line story in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and it says that Peter, the chief of the apostles, comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, I got this question I want to ask you. Okay, what's that? It says, Lord, if uh, another member of the church, now the, the actual Greek word there is, Adelphos, which is, it can be translated a brother as literally a brother as we understand it. It can also be translated a kinsman. Uh, and so, you know, that may be part of what's going on there because maybe he's having some problems with his brother Andrew. Uh, but it also can be translated another way, and that is another member of the church. Another member of the church sins against me. How often should I forgive? As many as seven times. Man, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to forgive you seven times. And Jesus says to him, not seven times, but I tell you 70 times 70. He says, no, 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 you can't put a limit on this. Forgiveness is not, it's not something that you can kind of, you know, kind of mold and meddle down, you know, because guess what? God doesn't work that way with us. Now, I understand there's some problems with forgiveness. And uh, one of the problems is I call them zombies. Uh, and that is to say that, you know, like the zombie movies where the living dead and they come back to life and they're trying to bite under people to make them zombies. Uh, sometimes you can forgive somebody uh, and then you can go along and all of a sudden somebody says something that reminds you of the way that you were hurt or somebody does something that kind of reminds you of the way that you're hurt or maybe they even the facial expression and reminds you of that. Uh, and all of a sudden, guess what? You're back into that person's, that, into that past there in that moment when you're hurt and, and you, you're going to have to forgive again. You're going to have to forgive them again. I mean, that's the way that humans, we work. You know, uh, there was uh, a great uh, Christian uh, teacher and speaker that she once said that uh, our forgiveness is kind of like, it's kind of like the, the guy that's ringing the church bell. And man, there's a rope there, and they're ringing that bell, and the bell keeps going right. And says, you can stop the ringing of the bell. You, you, can, forg you can forgive the, I mean, you know, you've let go of it, but that bell's still going to ring. 
you're still going to hear and, and remember what's happened, and you're going to have to forgive again. You're going to have to bless them with forgiveness again. Because it's just kind of like, you know, they come out like zombies. There's another problem with it, and it's honesty. Honesty in forgiveness. Because forgiveness is not, well, being nice, and I'm not going to say anything, you know, about it. And it's also not, I'm going to be an emotional terrorist and kind of keep pounding you about it or something like that. But it's being honest. You know, this is what happened, and, and you know, you need for me to forgive you for that. Yeah? I, let me give you a good example of Jesus on the cross he looks down at the people that have crucified him, that are ex- in the process of executing him. And what does he say over them? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And in that one sentence, what he's saying, he's reaching out and seeking for forgiveness for them. But as they hear that sentence, he's also saying, you're doing something terribly wrong, and you need to be forgiven. There's a certain amount of honesty that takes place in forgiveness. And there's also the problem with forgiveness is there's going to be consequences. I mean, you can forgive the offender, but the damage to the relationship is still there, and that damage has to be worked through. But what's the results that we're trying to aspire to? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. You'll see there what Paul says in Romans 12, which I think he's, he's pointing towards forgiveness when he says this. If, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In other words, be willing to share forgiveness and reconciliation with him. But, it, uh, you know, sometimes that's difficult to do. But he's calling us to make that a habit. And then there's another benefit to it. You'll see there Matthew 6. For if you, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your Father, your father forgive your trespasses. In other words, it's not a question. It's not an option to forgive, really. I mean, in the sense that if you want a right relationship with God, you've got to be willing to forgive other people. Those people who have hurt you. Even the people that don't deserve your forgiveness just the way that God acts towards us. So I want to suggest that you write out a growth covenant, a spiritual growth covenant for 2022. Uh, and uh, just to refer you to Nehemiah 9.39, where uh, it says this, uh, Nehemiah in the Old Testament, he says, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our spiritual leaders are affixing their seals to it. And, and when he says making a binding agreement, this is not a, well, if I can or if I get to it. But the, this is what I'm going to do. And this is where I'm going to do it and where I'm going to do it. So I'm going to be specific about my agreement. And then he says, and put it in writing. Because why? It don't mean nothing until it's signed on the bottom line, as somebody once said. In other words, you put it in writing, and then it becomes a reality. And then affi- and, you know, the affixing, the spiritual leaders affixing their seals to it, that means accountability. Who are you going to say, who are you going to, you know, kind of sign on to this that's going to kind of check on, with you? okay, how are you doing? How are you doing with forgiving? Uh, how are you doing with uh, getting along with the Lord each day? How are you doing with these things so that you can become accountable? That's how this stuff, not, it's not a wish, but it becomes a reality. So here's some, some questions that you and I can think over this week about how we can move forward and, and you know, what that would be like. The first one is when uh, or where are you going to get along with God each day? When is it going to be? Where is it going to be? And then the second one, does my offering to God need to be increased? Where are you on that? And then the third one, when and where am I going to start or restart the habit of gathering together for maybe a small group, gathering together for corporate worship with other Christians. And then finally, who do I need to forgive today? Who would that be? And is there someone I need to ask forgiveness from? Who would that be? To get in that habit of forgiveness. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your grace and goodness towards us, for your forgiveness of us, and for your willingness to bless us in so many ways. Help us. Help us to take seriously this task of of making a change in our lives for the better in this year. 
Help us to, to hunger that time alone with you each day. Help us to seek to, to put you first in our finances. Help us to, to gather together with other Christians to be encouraged. And help us to forgive so that we can become more like your son in this year. For we ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us in worship this day. Uh, and as we conclude, just want to lift up a few things. First of all is uh, your worship offerings. You can do those uh, to the church here, uh, uh, your offerings to the Lord. Uh, do that online at umcgs.org. You go there and click the Give button, and it'll send you to the Shelby Next Giving Portal, uh, which I, I like to use that. Uh, and uh, it's a quick and convenient way to give my offering. Uh, and then also you can do by mail if you'd like, uh, mailing in the check to 10928 Southwest 15th here in Yukon at 73099. Uh, and so those are ways that you can give. And you can, of course, if you come to worship in person, uh, you can give uh, through the offering boxes that we have here as well. Uh, just some uh, fellowship opportunity here for you uh, is Wednesday night meals. Uh, they are back and they go from 5.30 to 6.30 on Wednesday evening. The cost of the meal is $7 per person or $20 for a family. Uh, and this past week we had, uh, we had Cane's uh, chicken and, uh, you know, I like Cane's chicken. Uh, I'm, I'm sure about every kid in the universe likes Cane's chicken. Uh, and so we're just having some good stuff each week and some time for you to be with and see other Christians there uh, and a time to be encouraged. Uh, also, I just wanted to lift up that we are going to be doing a new Sunday school program for kids that's going to be starting in February, uh, and uh, Simply Loved is the name of it, and it's going to be Sunday mornings at 1030, and so something special and something new for the kids. Just want to make sure that you, you bring them for that time of encouragement as well and that time of teaching and being discipled, which is so important. With that, I want to just ask you to receive this benediction. May God bless you, encourage you, and strengthen you in your week. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.